until I got to grade 10, I never had that teacher that really inspired me and motivated me to want to do more, right? I literally just did enough to get by. This particular teacher, you know, he left me with a phrase that always stuck in my mind. And, you know, the funny thing is he was a gym teacher, right? But he said, you know, I'm not here to show you how to do it my way. I'm here to inspire you to learn the basics and then find a better way. So I went and I did a couple of workshops and they were a huge hit. I had something like 55 kids attending the first one and 70 attending the second one. And it was an amazing experience. And I came home and I was just glowing. I was bursting with energy. And my wife couldn't contain me at this point. Hello and welcome to the Qualified Tutor Podcast, the podcast that brings you the latest in the world of tutoring, edtech and education, and hopefully inspires in you the big change that each and every one of us is capable of. Qualified Tutor is an industry-leading tutor training organisation and online tutoring community for thousands of tutors around the world. This podcast is the voice of this community, where we aim to hear from tutors, Teachers, entrepreneurs, coaches, business experts, students, tutorpreneurs, and more from the world of tutoring about what inspires them every day, how they can help tutors like you, and what they've learned about tutoring along the way. The question is, what will you learn today? Hello and welcome to the 109th episode of the Qualified Tutor Podcast. I am uh, Ludo Miller, the host of this podcast. Welcome back to uh, regular listeners. Welcome to any of you for whom this is uh, your first time listening to the Qualified Tutor podcast. And of course, a huge welcome to today's guest, Reuven Zalmona. Reuven, welcome to the podcast. Well, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much uh, for joining us. I've, I first met Reuven back in uh, November of 2021, and I was... Uh, to be honest, I was blown away by our first meeting. Reuven brought a, a ton of energy and enthusiasm for teaching and learning, and I learned a great deal about the live workshops uh, he runs for kids. I've unfortunately never had the chance to attend one of his workshops, but if they have half the energy he brought to our first meeting, they'll be the most exciting lesson uh, that you've ever had. Now, hailing from Toronto in Canada, Reuven was able to transform his live uh, in-person classes into online sessions when the lockdown first struck. But uh, he's always asserted that there is no replacing the in-person uh, touch and feel of, of interactive learning. And since last year, he's been running these sessions in person again, helping students and parents see the power of on-hands and inquiry-based learning with experiments and projects such as, I'm going to reel a couple of, off, a couple of them off, Battle Tops, Marble Maze, Zip Liner, uh, Airplane Launcher, to name just a few. Reuven is smiling uh, gleefully as I name these. These are all his inventions. Uh, and don't worry, if you don't know what these are, you'll hopefully have a better idea of some of them in about 25 minutes' time. So that is Reuven Zalmona. Welcome, Reuven. Uh, what's giving you reason to smile today, Reuven? I, I always love sharing uh, my passion for education with with people who understand where I'm coming from. <clears throat> you know, there's, um, you know, it's funny that sometimes you go to parties and you ask people what they're doing and then you tell them you're a teacher and people are just going to start walking away because they don't want to talk about how poorly they did when they were in school. Um, so whenever I get a chance to really share my passion with other people who understand and share the same feeling it, it always brings a smile on my face well hopefully you'll bring a smile to uh, the faces of our listeners today as well Ruben. I'm, I'm sure of it and part of that may be in uh, a little expo exploration of uh, a school report that you managed to find uh, in the last week or so now uh, just briefly uh, listeners may have heard over the past few episodes we have been I've been asking guests to see if they can find any old school reports uh, from their childhood uh, and bring them to the podcast and read any that they find amusing or interesting or symbolic 
uh, to the first uh, to the first few moments of the podcast. So, Reuven, I'm going to hand over to you and let you read out uh, a school report that you have found. Yeah. So this particular school report is uh, it's a comment that stuck with me in the way it was phrased uh, pretty much my whole life. Uh, this is from my grade seven report, but pretty much all my elementary reports were the same. So I just picked this one out because it really kind of, the teacher was very eloquent and he was very good with his diction. So he chose just the right words to always keep it in my mind and make it memorable. And I hope you guys find it kind of amusing too, but it says, <laughs> uh, Ruben is a highly intelligent student who chooses to do just enough to get by. He is a, he is outstanding and mediocrity. <laughs> <laughs> outstanding at mediocrity. Yeah. And you remember reading that all the way back? I, well, I remember reading it because I knew that it was true, right? And it's part of the reason why I became a teacher myself because until I got to grade 10, I never had that teacher that really inspired me and motivated me to want to do more, right? I literally just did enough to get by because I knew that that's all I needed to do. And I had other interests, you know, there was sports, there was video games, you know, school wasn't at the forefront. But then when I was in 10th grade, I had that one teacher that I think all of us could kind of think back and relate to that you have that one teacher that really makes learning fun and inspiring and, and wants you to do better, not because they're forcing you because you want to. And that's the first time I learned that student led learning is really where education happens. And, and at that point I knew that I wanted to be an educator. So how have you flipped Reuven is outstanding at mediocrity into into why you do what you do today, Ruben? Well, so once I realized that a teacher's job isn't just to repeat information and the student's job isn't just to regurgitate it back to you, once I realized that, that school has more meaning and that the, the stuff that I was learning was more than just what I was reading on the textbook, when I realized that there's real-world applications and that you can really strive to do something better and this particular teacher you know he left me with a phrase that always stuck in my mind and you know the funny thing is he was a gym teacher right but he said you know i'm not here to show you how to do it my way i'm here to inspire you to learn the basics and then find a better way right and that's the kind of attitude that i always take into the classes that i teach that I'm not here to just get you to repeat it the way I do it. I want to inspire you to do better because the, our kids, the next generation, they're the future of whatever's going to happen in our world over the next 20, 30, 50 years. And so it's not just them repeating what we tell them to do. It's them finding better ways and more innovative ways to do things. And then we see how the world has evolved over the last 20, 30, 50 years since a lot of us were in school. And you can't even recognize that world. And so that is because we had a handful of people who were innovators, who thought out of the box, who, who were inspired by their teachers to do something better. And I walk into the classroom and I walk into every workshop that I run with that attitude that I'm here to show you the basics, to inspire you to do better. And, and a lot of the times the kids have, end up teaching me and surprising me. And it's that back and forth that makes everything worthwhile. So is this really, was this the basis of uh, the live educational workshops that you've come to start delivering that I was mentioning just in that introduction? Is this where they've come from this, 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 this approach? So no, not really. Like basically what happened is I, I, when I first started teaching as a classroom teacher, I was a math and science teacher and I, I taught some English and, and history and so on. Um, but then I, I'm lucky enough that I happen to work for a school district that's very progressive thinking. And about seven or eight years ago, they asked me to become the STEM director for the school district, which was 
an, an extremely exciting challenge and an awesome opportunity. And, and just when the position was offered to me, the ideas that already started going through my head were limitless, right? Because in my classroom, I used to do a lot of hands-on building and constructing and engineering and application. But I always had to kind of weasel my way around the curriculum in order to fit everything in. But with this new position, they basically gave me free reign to do whatever I wanted, which was incredible. So I became the STEM director. And then for about two years, I was doing it in my school and so on. And then um, one of the rec center directors in my city approached me and said, hey, you know, we love your program. My child was in your class. It's amazing. Would you mind doing a couple of free workshops or a couple of workshops at our local community center? And I'm like, sure. You know, to me, it was just about the opportunity to inspire more kids. You know, that's why I got into this in the first place, not just the kids in my classroom. Let's get this to the community. So that opportunity was incredible. So I went and I did a couple of workshops and they were a huge hit. I had something like 55 kids attending the first one and 70 attending the second one. And it was an amazing experience. And I came home and I was just glowing. I was bursting with energy and my wife couldn't contain me at this point. Right. Um, and I mean, at the time I was also running my tutoring business um, on top of teaching. And, and then it came down to simple math. Right. Um, and the math was that when I tutor, I would tutor, like I would charge between 50 and $70 an hour for tutoring, but I get to see one child at a time and even if it did two, three hours a night, okay, it's, it was good extra income. But then the math was simple. If I get 20, 30 kids in a room at one time, each paying $20 a piece, I mean, the math was easy. And then at that point, I started seeking out more opportunities to run these kind of workshops. I started approaching schools and rec centers and camps and synagogues and churches and basically anywhere that had kids, I would approach them and say, do you want to run this kind of workshop? And I'd show them some of the creations that the kids make as part of the workshop. And everybody wanted to be a part of this. And that's when it kind of started snowballing to where we got to today. I mean, today we start, we run educational birthdays. We do, you know, the funny thing, a funny story is that when we just went to vacation to Mexico and on the way back from Mexico, we had a 12 hour layover in Mexico city and the kids were bored. My kids were bored. So I went and I picked up a couple of pieces from the, convenience store like some straws some popsicle sticks whatever and we started building right there in the airport and next thing you know i had a group of nine kids sitting with me building these <laughs> projects you know um i had two kids that only spoke spanish and one kid that spoke german and the rest spoke english but we all kind of figured out a way to work together and we had an awesome time and we were able to do this for two or three hours but yeah, and kids love doing this stuff. And when you give them the opportunity, this is what really makes that difference, you know? So what is, you've maybe just explained it there in that little story about the airport. What is the power of these sessions? What, why are they so popular? Okay, so really what it comes down to is the core philosophy behind what, how cool is that is in my teaching philosophy. And it's that, if you understand and you can apply math and science, you can build amazing things using common household items or by spending $5 at most at a, at a dollar store or, or a big box store, right? Because the point is, and one of the things I was explaining about when I was learning and inspired is that the curriculum that we learn in school isn't just for us to read and repeat or for us to be able to do the equation and solve the problem. These things have real world applications. So if we can take, you know, uh, a pizza box and five straws and a sheet of cardboard and build a working a nanometer, that is where the magic happens, right? You don't need to spend thousands of dollars on kits and, and materials. The, the, the material and the, and the kits that you need is all up in here in your head. It's all about ingenuity and imagination and trying to figure out how to use this for what I need to do it, right? Um, the definition of engineering is how to solve a problem in hand with the materials that I have available. Sometimes I don't have 
a thousand dollars worth of materials in a full workshop to solve a problem? How do I use what I have in front of me? But if I understand math and science, and this is what I try to show the kids, if we understand math and science, we can build these awesome things. And like you mentioned, there's a whole bunch of projects that you've listed off. And, you know, I'm sure I can sit here and list off a whole bunch, but I don't want to waste the whole podcast on that. But the idea is that we build hundreds of projects with the same materials. No project costs more than $1.15 materials. The materials can all be found at your local big box store, dollar store. Um, and on top of that, I think one of my biggest motivations when running How Cool Is That is I want the kids to be inspired to do more after class is over. So when I was running my science class before I started being STEM director, I remember bringing into class um, one of these outside groups that did awesome experiments. And they started doing cool stuff with dry ice and all this, and it was amazing. But after class was over, one of the kids came up to me and said, you know, I want to do more of this. Where do I get dry ice from? And I was like, I don't know, <laughs> right? I don't even know the store. Where do you order it from? And that's when it kind of hit me. You know, now that these people left with their dry ice, so what, the learning is over? Well, that's ridiculous. That, that's really not our job as teachers. Our job as teachers to inspire the kids to keep learning after we're not there. So by using dollar store materials, now the kids can go home and start tinkering on their own and building new stuff. And when I see kids coming back the following week or the following month, it's amazing the stuff that they've come up with on their own. I'm sure those are some of the more heartwarming moments to you, Ruben, when you see, <laughs> you see that in action, you see your inspiration in action. Yeah, you know, on, on a daily basis, I see these kind of things happening from a learning standpoint, which is incredible. But I actually want to share a different story with you for a second, if you will allow me. Please. You know, I, uh, because I do a lot of hands-on stuff with the kids, you know, it's just fun, right? The kids think they're playing. They don't realize how much they're learning, you know? So when we build like that anatometer that I told you, and then we use um, the formula for calculating uh, the circumference of a circle to try to measure wind speed, they don't understand their learning. They think it's fun. They're playing games and now they have a challenge. You have to figure out how to do this. But about two months ago, one of the kids in my classes, um, I, and I didn't know this at the time, but he, his family went through a severe trauma. His older brother um, died in a car accident. It was very tragic. Um, and uh, this child hasn't spoken to anyone in two months. And he came to my class and he's, you know, working and all this. And he's not saying a word. And I was like, why is this kid never talking? You know, but he's so engaged, right? And then at the end of the class, he came up to me and started talking to me and showed me what he did. Sorry, I'm sorry to tear up. And his mom is at the door and she's crying. And then she tells me the story. And I was like, wow. You know, and just like not only the connection that I made with him on an education level, but the fact that this fun, engaging environment can create the, the connection on other levels. You know, that's what kind of keeps me going, you know? That is such a powerful story, Ruben. <laughs> Thank you for for sharing that. Um, yeah. I, I wonder then what that tells us about because your your philosophy, Ruben, has has always been exactly what you've just been speaking about. This inquiry based learning, inspiring kids to ask the questions themselves through your guidance, through your scaffolding. For those who don't know who are listening, what that phrase means, can you just tell us a little bit more what what you what inquiry based learning means to you? Yeah. So. You know, one of the things that frustrates me about education and the education industry in general, whether it's, um, you know, kits that you buy sometimes at stores or, or teachers in general, is, is that we don't really adhere to basic educational philosophy. There's two basic educational philosophies that all teachers should really abide by. The first one is Bloom's taxonomy, Right. Bloom's taxonomy is divided into six levels, right? The lower three levels, which we call lower order thinkers, are just um, understanding, repeating, and applying, 
right? Those are the lower three levels because basically it's just me telling you something and you're repeating it back to me or writing it down in a different way. That's basically all it is. The higher three levels, this is where we want to try to get kids to be, right? We want them to become higher order thinkers. And all of us can look up Bloom's taxonomy on the internet. I mean, it's all there. But really, the, the higher level thinkers are able to evaluate, synthesize, and create. So basically, they take what they learned in the lower three levels. Now they evaluate what they learned. They put it in a new situation by synthesizing. And then they create something new based on the knowledge that they've had that they've received, right? And so the scaffolding works because we teach them the information, but then we challenge them to synthesize and create using that information. And then the second educational philosophy is uh, it's Lev Vygotsky's zone of proximal development. And basically zone of proximal development, and again, this is something we can look up, but it's basically create, it's three circles. So there's a small circle, a medium circle, and a large circle. The small circle in the middle, this is what a learner or a child can do on their own. And the large circle on the outside is, is where we want them to be. And the middle circle, this is our job as teachers, that we guide them from the inner circle to the outer circle by scaffolding and showing them the steps until they're able to grow. And our job as teachers is to help kids grow. But we can't do that by being the sage on the stage, right? Like the focus shouldn't be on the teacher. The focus should be on the student. Right. So instead of being the stage on the stage as teachers, we want to start being the guide on the side. Right. So by by doing project based learning, the kids are manipulating tools and and materials that they find at the dollar store or at the big box or whatever we we have to create something. And our job is to kind of interject and guide them until they get to their ultimate goal. Now, what is that ultimate goal? Well, it's different from child to child. Right, because every child eventually, after we taught them the basics, the lower level thinking, after they've repeated and learned that material, as they jump on to become higher level thinkers, every child might kind of spring in a different direction. And that's kind of where we have to guide them and reinforce the math and the science that we're kind of trying to teach them. And just to add a, a couple of things, <laughs> you know. Um, the first thing is, you know, the way we teach things at school is actually really counterintuitive to the way things work in the real world, right? Um, I've never heard of a job where you go in and from 9.30 to 10.30 you do math, but then from 10.30 to 11.30 you do geography, and then from 11.30 to 12.30 you do science, right? It doesn't exist. Every day we have to draw on knowledge from everything that we learn in order to create a final creation. So by adopting project-based learning, this is exactly what we do, right? So for example, one of the projects that we build is a Morse code machine. Well, Morse code machine is really a method of communication. And I start the lesson by saying, look, this is text messages in the 1930s, right? But we get to talk about things like the Enigma machine, World War II, uh, the Allies and the Axis. But because the kids are fully engaged in building this Enigma machine, I mean, sorry, this Morse code machine, and they're able to send messages back and forth through their most code machines and they develop their own codes. They are fully 100% engaged in this project. They took ownership of this project. This project is theirs and they want to know more about it because now this becomes student-led learning, right? How do I create a new code? How do I decipher someone else's code? How is this used through history? And then we are able to incorporate all these other strands of the curriculum into this project. So it's not just a science and math or STEM project. Now there's history and there's language and there's teamwork and fine motor skills and collaboration and creativity and all these things that go into one. And it all starts with one tiny little project that costs a dollar fifty in materials, you know? <laughs> Ruben, what do you want education to look like? by 2030? So I, I think I think everybody could kind of already <laughs> see where, where my passions lie when it comes to this. And like I mentioned, I'm a STEM director for a progressive school district that, that appreciates the value of STEM. But I believe that every classroom, and let's forget about classrooms, right? Like tutors, parents, 
instructors, whether it's at camp or anywhere, we have to adopt a project-based learning approach because this not only encourages creativity and imagination, but, you know, I'm going to throw out some statistics at you right now, but this generation that's growing up right now is considered to be um, about 57% less proficient in fine motor skills than any previous generation in history. And the reason is, as I call it, I call it the tablet generation or the screen generation because everything that they do is on a screen, right? So if I take my child, my children, for example, you know, my son plays Minecraft and he comes up to me and he says, hey, daddy, look what I built on Minecraft. It's this castle with this and that and that. And I look at him as if you did nothing. Right? All you did was swipe your finger across the screen and the machine did everything. Let's go in the garage. Let's go and get some of the stuff from the dollar store and let's actually build it. Right? Hands-on application is really important for fine motor skills. Also for collaborations, working with other people, coming up with new ideas. Um, our education system is flawed in that in 200 years, since our current education, the modern education system was created, it barely has changed, right? Kids are still going to class, sitting in a group, reading out of a textbook, repeating information, solving math equations, writing essays, what have you. But the world around us has changed drastically. So why hasn't the education system evolved just like the world around us? So project-based learning is really the way to do that because I'm not saying that what we are teaching in school is not important, but as I said before, that's lower level thinkers. Our job is to create higher level thinkers. And by adopting project-based learning, we're allowing every instructor, whether you're a tutor or a parent or a teacher in a classroom or a camp instructor or whatever you are, to inspire and push kids further by bringing this kind of education to them. So project-based learning it, it just such, has such a positive impact on every child that comes through. Even the kids that are amazing at the standard way of teaching, the way we do it in the classroom, they come in as like, wow, like, I, look at how much more I can do. You know, I walked into a grade 10 classroom. I did a workshop and we built a, a machine called a clinometer. And a clinometer is a, it's a little device that you're able to measure the height of any building or any tall structure um, using, a, we use a piece of paper, a straw, uh, a paper clip, and a string. And just with those four items, I can measure the height of any building. But we have to use trigonometry. And at the end of the class, the kids will come up to me and like, wait a second, Ruben, you're telling us that there's actually a practical application to trigonometry? I'm like, yeah, look at that, right? So it's, yeah, the, 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 when that light bulb goes off in the kid's mind, when they see that there's a real world application to the stuff that they're learning, just like I told you at the beginning about me, when I needed that inspiration to see that there's more, that's exactly what it provides to other kids. And if you want to become that educator who is able to inspire the next generation of students, who's able to be that teacher, <laughs> who students look back on in 20, 30 years time and say, that was the educator, that was the tutor, that was the instructor, the guide who changed my, my perception, then please reach out to Reuven after this. As you can tell, he's uh, incredibly happy talking about what he does and very, very generous uh, in, his, uh, in, his, in the way he talks about what he does. Uh, how cool is that teacher.com uh, is where you can head to, to, to find out a little bit, bit more about Reuven and his workshops. Uh, that'll be in the show notes below as well. Uh, and if you want to become a, a licensee of the How Cool Is That um, method and approach and methodology with uh, loads of resources, and uh, videos and guides as to how to run these workshops. Um, Reuven offers licenses to educators. So you can get in touch with Reuven and be part of this wonderful philosophy and approach of inquiry-based learning, a project-based learning. If you're not convinced after that, I don't know what else Reuven has to do to <laughs> convince you. Um, but Reuven, thank you so much for joining us. That was really action-packed and, and, and also very moving um, 25 minutes. So uh, thank you for sharing. I hope you enjoyed talking about what you do. Always do. <laughs> well, um, we will have you back on um, very shortly, Ruben, because 
um, our listeners, I'm sure, will be very appreciative of, of, of not only what you do, but also the why behind it. Uh, and, and hearing that, again, uh, is a very inspiring thing for educators, not just for students. Um, and that's the kind of guests we like having on this podcast. So, Reuven, thank you so much for joining us. Next time, we're going to be joined by uh, a brand ambassador of the platform, Super Prof, the uh, kind of international uh, tutoring uh, platform that connects tutors and, and, and students. Uh, he is called Pablo. Uh, he lives in London, and we'll be chatting to him a little bit about, about the platform Super Prof and also about uh, language learning. Um, so do stick around for that uh, next time. Uh, but for one final time, uh, Ruben, for our 109th episode, thank you so much for coming on as a guest. Uh, and cheerio. No, it was my pleasure. Thank you very much. And I hope to talk to everyone very shortly. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Qualified Tutor Podcast. Whether you're a regular listener of this podcast or you've just stumbled across it, Join the Qualified Tutor podcast group within the Qualified Tutor community to stay up to date with our latest news, offers, workshops, and of course, simply to meet other tutors like you. Whatever your level as a tutor, our training courses will be the next step in your professional development. Visit qualifiedtutor.org training to find out more about our CPD accredited and Ofqual recognized courses, the first of their kind in the tutoring industry. Your student deserves the best tutor possible. Make that happen today by joining Qualified Tutor.